Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As the pastor says, hope everyone's things saved and safe. I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements for everyone. Remember, if you have any prayer requests, names to add to the prayer list, or any praise reports, please send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, since we're unable to pass around the, the fasting calendar, please continue up to do your, your normal dates. Uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, throw a few extra meals on there. Well, we need fasting 24-7 during this time. Uh, remember when all of our videos drop, uh, it's 8 a.m. on YouTube for Sundays, 10 a.m. on Facebook for Sunday service. Uh, Brother Thomas's lessons on Wednesdays are available on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on both platforms, as well as our Sunday school lessons that drop on Friday night are available on YouTube and Facebook at 5 p.m. Uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that while we're down here, we're continuing to pray over the names in the box, the soldiers, everything that the elders prayed for when we had service, we're continuing to pray for those things. And also the pastor is continuing to read out the names on the prayer list and he's continuing to pray for them daily. Lastly, we just want to continue to thank everyone that makes this possible. Uh, thank the choir for the songs. Thank Brandon Need for opening their house up to me. I thank for, for everyone that gets the messages ready. Those are down here recording, everyone that edits, uploads, and any part that you played in this. We just want to thank everyone. We thank the pastor for trusting us to do this. And most of all, we want to thank God for making this possible. So if you guys need anything, need help with anything, need someone to talk to, just if you need anything at all, just reach out to us, call, text, email, stop by, whatever it is. We love you guys, we want to help you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As always, if you guys missed the major announcements, please feel free to, to rewind and catch those. Remember, send any prayer requests, praise reports, names to add to our prayer list to cljcrequests at gmail.com. And also, we're still asking you guys to please continue to pray and fast for Zach Carter. Uh, today, we'll be on lesson three that is faithful in persecution. Focus thought is we must remain faithful no matter what the persecution we face. Focus verse is Revelation uh, 2 and 10. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Lesson text is Revelation 2, 8 through 11. <coughs> Excuse me. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, Right, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we love you, God, we praise you, God, we thank you, God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your mercy and your grace, your kindness, God, your blessings for keeping cancer out of the church, our travelers safe, our soldiers safe, just everything you've done for us. God, we're not worthy of everything you've done. God, I ask you to bless this service. God, use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Give me a word of knowledge and a word in season. Let it be a right word. Let it be a powerful word. Let it go out. Let lives be changed. Let hearts be prayed. Let people see that we need to be faithful to you. And whatever season we are in our life, whatever trouble they may be in, that we need to be faithful to you. God, let your people be faithful and watching these videos. God, help keep your church united. God, and keep us gathered together. I know we're meeting virtually right now, God, but you can still keep us unified even though we're not in the building. I ask Lord to bless us, the, the people that are suffering with this virus, bless those that are fighting it. God, you can speak that word of healing into their lives and speak that word to take this virus away and just do whatever it takes to bring us into the, the building together. One more time, God, we give you all the praise and the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. seated. Uh, now I'll have to admit to you guys when I, uh, I first saw the lesson title I did uh, give a, a little bit of an eye roll when I saw that word persecution mentioned in it. Um, I, you know, I probably mentioned it several times this year but people in America talk about you know what persecution is and suffering but we really truly don't know what persecution is. We think we do but we really don't. <clears throat> we have what I would say is pressure from the world. We have name calling, we have mocking the way we dress, how we worship, how we speak in tongues, the, the things that we do. And that may weigh on some of us quite a bit, but it can't hold the candle to the real persecution that the first world, the first church had and what happens in other countries in this world. You know, there's, you can go on the news and see churches being burned, people are being imprisoned, tortured, and even killed. And they're facing actual persecution that what the first church suffered countries like China and North Korea you, you know you can face four generations of your family going to a labor camp or even worse being put to death there are people that that smuggle Bibles into these countries knowing the punishment that they face that's how much they value the Word of God they value it over their own lives and the lives of their family and we should be grateful that we don't have to experience things like that and should be in constant prayer for people who do have to experience those things now we've heard some dandies this past year when it comes to to interesting theories that are that are floated about and you know there's some that's this whole thing's been a, a massive thing to change or in the church but I can tell you after 140 150 plus messages that we've done and and hundreds of hours that we've put into this thing Tens of thousands of dollars we've given away, baptisms we've done, baby dedications we've done, prayer cloths given, and, and Piedmont Prayer said that the church is still alive and well and function like it always has and like it always will be. And like the book says, uh, many modern North American Christians haven't suffered persecution that the first church did or even uh, that which the early modern church themselves faced. Real persecution 
they suffered, not just having their feelings hurt. You know, <laughs> the pastor talked about a minister, and I believe it was uh, Paul Deaton, and that was way before my time, but how people would actually shoot at them as they drove by when they, they went to preach. And uh, around the time of the Azusa Street Revival, there was a man who wrote many famous hymns. I, I couldn't remember his name off the top of my head when I was preparing this. Um, and I believe we sing a handful of his songs even to this day. But he got saved and he had the revelation of the oneness of God. And one day he was faced with an ultimatum at his job. They told him, he said, either you renounce your newfound beliefs, your newfound church, or you're finished. No more hymns, nothing published, facing what we would call now being blacklisted. And when faced with that choice, either his livelihood or his faith, he walked out the door. He chose truth over everything, over making money, over making his employer happy. He gave up everything he had. All those years he spent working and publishing, gave up rights, gave up everything just to serve God. And that can be a lesson to all of us, whether it's the pressure that we face in modern times or there's actual real instances of persecution that people face. The key is remaining faithful throughout all of it. We read it earlier, but Revelation 2 and 10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Whatever comes against you guys, hold on. Don't fear. He's telling them times are going to get hard. Imprisonment is about to come. Death may even come to some of you. But if you remain faithful, you're going to receive a crown of glory. You're going to receive that crown of life. The church in Smyrna would face persecution, but it wasn't only localized to them. Persecution across the Roman Empire existed for some time. And we know of Roman officials that were guilty of it. But we also have discussed over this past year the length of, of Paul's backstory and what Paul did to the church. You know, he had people thrown in prison, tortured, beaten. Many were beaten without mercy in an attempt to force them to renounce their beliefs. Paul said, I even compelled these people to try and blaspheme. And then he said, I had them put to death. I gave my voice for their death sins. And, and we think, you know, being virtual for a whole year is a tough ordeal, but it's nothing compared to what it was like to be a part of the early church, surrounded by those that despised them, that saw them as their enemies, whether it be the Jews who got upset over who they preached Jesus really was and who they believed Jesus really was, or the Romans who saw them as a, a, a strange group, a strange cult, believed they performed unnatural rituals. They were troublemakers that were upsetting the balance of the empire, and that's something Rome could not stand for. Their worship of only one God, what we call monotheism now, made them stand out quite a bit to every other religion of that day. The Bible often has themes that, that, that repeat itself, and, and God's people are persecuted by a pagan nation whose religion is at the center. It's at the forefront of everything that goes on in their nation at the time. It's what their country revolves around. You don't serve what they serve, then you don't live. That's as simple as it was. We saw it in Babylon, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel stayed faithful in his service to God. The three Hebrew boys refused to bow down to the king's image. They refused to worship the king's image. They faced jail and were even given death sentences for their beliefs, yet they remained faithful all the way. And it's hard to imagine being able to face a worse punishment than being thrown into a fiery furnace or being tossed into a lion's den, knowing you're about to die. But those men stayed faithful unto God, even though they knew they faced certain death and they received their reward from God. The first church was no different in, in the problems that it faced uh, to the emperor, <coughs> excuse me, in the empire, you know, you, you look to the emperor and he was a god, basically. That's who they deified. And, and, you know, everyone had their own localized religions. If you went down to Egypt or Carthage or different parts of, of the empire, everybody could have their own little god, their own religious system they had before Rome showed up. The Greeks were even allowed to do this themselves, which was kind of nice of the Romans because basically they just copy and pasted everything that the Greeks believed and just changed a few names around. But the, the one sticking point, like I said, in the Roman religious system was, was the worship 
and the deifying of the emperor. They made him into what we would call a little G-God, and that's nothing new under the sun like we talked about with Nebuchadnezzar. He did it himself, and it's been going on for thousands of years, and it still goes on today, and I've seen four presidents in my lifetime, and at some point in each and every one of their terms, their supporters exalt them high above the rest of us, essentially deifying them like the Romans did their emperors, and they become devout followers of those politicians, and, and men does it with politicians, with athletes, with celebrities, and, and sometimes, sadly, we even see it with ministers happening in church, but the first church knew that worshiping the worship of man was essentially wrong with it. It went against God's word. You were free to worship as long as you threw in what Rome wanted you to worship at that time. And many nations gladly accepted this, but not the first church. Knowing this would put them at odds with the most powerful nation of the world. At that time, they continued to stay faithful to God, even though they knew the severe, excuse me, severe consequences of their actions. The Jews were not friendly to them either, like Rome. But you got to remember, a good portion of the early church came from the Jewish ranks. They were converted Jews themselves. So many saw these former Jews as traitors and blasphemers, turning their backs on their own people. We mentioned Paul earlier, but he wasn't the only one that was dispatched to harass the church. Uh, if you go to Acts 17, 1 through 7, that when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went unto them, and three days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Paul is just doing his thing. He's going in, and he's preaching the truth. And some were converted that day, but the ones who were not converted, they got riled up. The Bible says that they were moved with envy, and they gathered lewd fellows, evil, wicked sinners, the worst of the worst that society had to offer, and they gathered them to assault the house of Jason. And they gathered the company together, and this was not a peaceful group that went to Jason's house, all because they did not like the truth that Paul had to preach. They, it says they stirred up the whole city, and they grabbed poor Jason and some other people and brought them before the rulers. And the only charge that the Jews could think of that they could try to make stick was that they were breaking Caesar's laws, claiming there was another king besides Caesar. But God brings them out of this trial. Paul and Silas are sent away by night for safety, and they come to a town called Berea. And the Bible says they went right into the synagogue, had just escaped an angry mob. And you would think at this time, Paul and Silas are thinking, maybe we should lay low, maybe we should let things cool down. But that's not what happened. They were not deterred by the persecution that they suffered that day, and they went straight into the synagogue. And because they didn't give up, many people were saved. It says they, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scripture daily, the people who were now converted. Now word gets back to Thessalonica where they just came from, and again these people stir up the town. And again Paul and Silas are forced to leave. Two mobs come up against Paul while he's preaching the truth, and twice he escapes. Now he finds himself in Athens, and you think again now would be a good time in this very large city to rest and to lay low. But what does he do? The Bible says he went straight to the synagogue in Athens. He goes there and he goes to the market preaching the same message as he had done before, disputing with the Jews and debating with the philosophers of his time. And this eventually leads to the message on Mars Hill, leading to even more people being saved. Jesus said in Matthew 10 and 22, And ye shall be hated 
of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. There's always going to be someone that wants to come and stand up against the church. It's been that way since day one, and it's going to be that way until the end of time. If you ever witnessed to a few people, or if you've ever answered their questions about the Bible or what we believe, why we believe, chances are you've been mocked when they say, why do you dress the way you dress? Why do you act the way you act? And we tell them, you know, people are skeptical. People tend to laugh. People tend to make fun. And, and as much as we dislike the thought not everyone is going to like us. Not everyone is going to love us. The devil try, constantly tries to use this to his advantage. And why is that? Because he knows how weak man can be. Sometimes he's spent thousands of years studying them. There doesn't have to be an angry mob that's coming up against us. No one has to come and try and kill us, to, or kill our families, burn our houses down, come at us in any other way to get us to crack. What, what leads a lot of people to crack and to give an end to the world or simply just giving up is the fear of simply looking different. The Bible says that we are a peculiar people. That means we are a strange when it comes to be compared to the rest of the world. We're supposed to stand out just a little bit, but oftentimes people don't want to be considered strange because that itself leads to mocking and ridicule. And it's a small stumbling block, but it's one that's been effective and plagued uh, the church for the past 2,000 years. Peculiar means, you know, that we, we act different, we dress different, we talk different, we think different than the world does. And that being different opens us up to a lot of things and a lot of pressure that we face from the world. And people feel, excuse me, fear the pressure of feeling and being different so much that they simply find it easier just to give in, just to blend in with the rest of the world so they don't have to face that pressure that comes with it. And whether it be pressure from the world or, or persecution, that, and some people may actually face real persecution, we can't fear any of these things or let them cause us to stumble. In the lesson text we read where the, the church of Smyrna was told everything that they would suffer, they said 10 days of tribulation, needing, and he says, even remain faithful unto death. And then it says, fear none of these things that thou shalt suffer. And those are tough words to swallow, but it takes a life built on Christ to have your actual foundation being Jesus Christ to truly withstand something like that. And, and if I told you that tomorrow you were going to lose your home, your job, and all your vehicles, you might get a tad worried. But Jesus is telling us, whatever happens to you, do not fear. And I couldn't help but think of uh, my Nana's favorite piece of advice. Many of you guys are very familiar with it. It's short and simple. Suck it up. Short, simple, sweet, and really good advice, whatever the situation generally is. And it's a very popular phrase. It's not just her trademark saying. When things get bad, when times get tough, sitting around crying and whining and worry about your situation isn't going to fix your problem. Yet I know that not everyone is a fan of that saying. I've seen memes, people posted on Facebook saying, well, if I broke your arm, I guarantee you, you wouldn't tell me to, to sit around and suck it up or walk in my shoes for a couple of days and you wouldn't be saying that. But you can't say anything like that when it comes to revelation. You know, it, it's easy to say not to fear anything, but how about living it? Well, both people that are talking in Revelations chapter 2 actually endured tribulations during their time and they stuck it out. <clears throat> There's John who calls himself in chapter 1 a companion in tribulation. And, and I don't know anyone who would disagree with me with saying that the apostles suffered a great deal of persecution during their time on this earth. He can talk the talk here because he actually walked the walk. And then there's Jesus. Revelation 2 is written in red. You know, that means that's Jesus' words. And Jesus is telling us not to fear. And look what all Jesus himself had to endure. He suffered it all, like the song says, because he loved me. He's more qualified than anyone to tell us to not fear anything. Uh, John 16 and 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in, in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And I know we've talked about that scripture just in, in the past few lessons, I believe, but think about it for a minute. He says, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have trials. You're going to be mocked. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be hated, beaten, spit upon everything for what you believe. But don't ever 
get down about it. Be of good cheer. When trouble comes, rejoice and be thankful. The problems you're facing right now, I've already been there and I have already overcome those. When life comes at you hard, when the devil comes at you hard, remember that Jesus has already been where you've been and he's already won that battle. A song we sing says, how great it is to serve a living God who sees each breath I take and every step I tried. How great it is to serve a God that's real, who sees my every tear and knows just how I feel. How great it is to have a God that not only cares about you, but that he also came down to walk the same exact path that you're walking to feel exactly what you feel, to know the pain and, and the heartache and everything that you are going to be facing through your life. And so he can tell us when trouble comes, be of good cheer. Do not be afraid because I've already been where you've been. Smyrna faced a lot of tough things, and we probably don't know all the things that they faced at that time, yet they held fast. The Revelation 2 and 9 says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but the, are the synagogue of Satan. God saw their works and he saw their tribulations. He saw all their sufferings and he even saw their poverty. Were they just in a, a poor area or were they poor because of persecution? People wouldn't allow them to buy and sell in the markets. Uh, we simply don't know. Could it be a combination of both? The, the Bible doesn't exactly say why they were poor. But even though they were poor, they said you're in poverty in an earthly sense. Jesus said, but thou art rich. They weren't rich in an earthly sense, but they were rich in a heavenly sense. A church operating as it should. He said, I have seen thy works and I have seen your actions in the middle of these tribulations. And add on top of that, being poor, you're still continuing to do the work that the church is supposed to be doing. I see the blasphemes which they speak against you, the sheer hate that the church faced, constantly being railed on and being spoken evil of. And, and Jesus called them the synagogue of Satan. Can you, you can only imagine how tough these people were and how much they had hate in their heart. And I can't just imagine them being called, you know, holy rollers and, and a few mild insult, insults being tossed their way. It must have been some pretty bad stuff. And, and even though the harsh words were said to the people, their blasphemies were directed themselves at God. Because when you attack the church, you attack God himself. So the next time someone launches into you or, or laughs at you and mocks you, don't let it phase you. Let God handle it because you're, if you're truly in the capital C church, they're not only attacking you, they're attacking him. And you come after one of his children and you're coming after his bride, the one that gave everything for his bride. I wouldn't want to even be 10 foot near where they're standing at that moment because that would be a scary place to be. Smyrna had to face uh, plenty and now Jesus is telling him you're going to have to face even more. The hits are just going to keep on coming. There are times in life that it has to get worse before anything can get better. But whatever comes, remember Jesus said, be of good cheer. And I like the point that the, the book made, if you guys read the lesson, it says God did not promise the complete removal of pain in this life, but he did promise to be faithful to us through the pain even as we are faithful to him. God is faithful to us, so we ourselves should be faithful to him. Faith is the substance uh, <coughs> excuse me, of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Having faith through persecution and tribulation sounds hard, but it's what you need. It, it's going to be the thing that gets you through those tough times. Faith is kind of like morale for soldiers who are, are fighting in a war. And there's a direct correlation between soldiers' morale and an army's success. The lower the morale, the less likely they are to succeed in battle. When Germany launched their attack into to France in World War II, it, it had to get creative in certain spots because the border between most of France and Germany was covered between tons of fortifications and forts and bunkers. Basically, they built a whole line to keep Germany from ever invading again. And in one large section of the front, when the Germans attacked, they, they needed to bust through. So they pounded all day with artillery, and they sent their dive bombers in. And out of that long line of forts, and I forget the exact number of uh, miles of the, uh, how long the front was, but only 60 men died that entire day. And they could have held out for quite a bit longer. They were well fortified and supplied. 
But instead, the Germans began to see them raising up white flags, lifting up their hands and surrender, all because they were demoralized. They didn't suffer tons of casualties. They lost their morale. They lost their will to fight. The screaming whistles that the Germans had attached on their dive bombers put fear into them. The constant artillery that was raining down on them brought back the memories of the horrors that their relatives had experienced in World War I. And had they've had a different mindset, things may have turned out a little bit different. They let the troubles of the past dictate how they were going to handle their situation they were now facing in the present. Battles aren't always won by who has the bigger guns, who has the bigger bombs. Sometimes all it takes is winning the psychological battle. That's why we must remain faithful whatever we face. Faith is what's going to help get you through those times. Jesus asked, when the Son of Man comes, will I find faith on the earth? And I want to be found faithful because one day I want him to look at me and call me a good and faithful servant. Whatever comes at us, keep the faith. And if it comes down to have to die for us, Jesus said, be faithful to me unto death. And it, it would be nice if any time we have trouble or someone comes up against us, if Jesus tossed a few fireballs and a little bit of brimstone down and consumed anyone that stood in our way. But that's not how things work. Being a Christian means sometimes we have to endure things that are not very pleasant. In order to receive your reward, sometimes you have to put some effort in it. Sometimes you have to suffer through some pain. 1 Corinthians 15 and 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If our only hope was in this life, we would be most miserable. But our hope isn't in this world. We may not always see the blessings that we get for keeping the faith and enduring the trials, but that's because our treasures aren't always earthly. We have heavenly treasures as well. If you can go to Romans 8 and 18, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What happens to us on this world is nothing compared to what we have in store waiting for us if we keep the faith. When everyone tried to persuade Paul from leaving and going, he said, everywhere I go, witnesses abound. They say bonds and afflictions abide in me. If I go, it's not going to be a pleasant journey, and troubles and trials are definitely going to await me. But then he says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy, that I may fulfill the ministry that was given to me by the Lord Jesus, that I can testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And later on when they kept pressing him they, not to go, he said, why, do you weep? why are you crying so much for me? Why are, you making, why are you breaking my heart? He said, for I'm not ready just to be bound in Jerusalem. I'm ready to die in Jerusalem, keeping the faith until death, never wavering. Paul knew he had something better waiting for him on the other side. James 1 and 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is he that endures troubles and trials and temptation. If we just endure, we're going to wear that crown one day. And we don't know what all the future holds. Um, after we recorded uh, this week's Wednesday night lesson, we talked a minute or two afterwards about the tribulation. And, and, and like Thomas, I too am a fan of the, the wise thinker, uh, Brother Dwayne T. Bailey, in his famous quote of saying, I'm glad it says, blessed is he that readeth and keepeth this, and not blessed is he that understands it when it comes to Revelation, because there's a lot going on in Revelation that we just do not know and we do not understand. The, the tribulation itself is a very touchy subject. you got to watch what you say to people about it, because a lot of people are dead set and their beliefs on how things are going to go down. And they'll argue if the church is going pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation or, or post-tribulation. People spend hours upon hours upon hours pouring through the Bible, trying to find clues to, to search things out. And personally for me, I've yet to hear one single argument that settles the debate 100%. Because every time I've had someone explain it to me, the phrase, well, here's what I think this means, up here, I could, I could not, I don't have enough hands and fingers and toes and everything to count how many times I've heard that when it comes down 
to Revelation. So if you guys want my honest answer when it comes to the tribulation and, and when the church is going, I'll just let you know that I don't have one. And I simply do not know, and I suspect no one themselves truly does know the moment that the rapture is actually going to happen because Jesus told us that's none of our business. But what I do know is that if we remain faithful, we will receive our reward. Jesus said to remain faithful unto death. So if the day comes and the church has to endure either part of the tribulation or, you know, at the end they have to endure the whole thing, you have to keep the faith. If God spares us from having to endure any part of the, the final tribulation, you still have to keep the faith until he calls us home. We don't know when the end of the world is because it's not our job to know when that is. So I don't sit around trying and predicting the, the, the end of days, you know, to when the rapture is going to happen. If someone asks me, I tell them all that matters in the end is if you're saved or not. What matters isn't when he comes, but if you're ready, when he comes. So keep the faith until the day that he comes. And I'm starting to close here. And, and you've heard us uh, read these scriptures many, many times. These are what I'm going to leave you with. Uh, it's Paul's final words. And they let us know what's going to happen for us, for the ones who keep the faith. It's 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. No matter what we face, we must remain faithful to God till the end. Faithful, as Jesus said, all the way unto death, because that's the only way you're going to receive your crown, is if you remain faithful to God. No matter how tough it gets at the end, no matter what comes up against you, you have to remain faithful unto him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we love you, God. We praise you, God. We thank you, Lord. And we thank you for the chance and the opportunity to serve you, God, the chance to be faithful to you, God. God, help your people. Help keep us grounded. Help keep us rooted. God, help us be faithful to you no matter what trouble comes. Help us to always turn to you and to realize that you have overcome these things, that all we have to do is be of good cheer, that you have fought our battles for us, God, that you'll never lead us astray and you'll always be there for us. And we know the day may come where we may have to face a few things, God, but keep us, God, rooted and like saying ground and build our foundation upon you God if there's anything in there any junk in there tear it out God and help us be built upon that solid rock and again I ask you Lord to bless the service use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom let it go out let, let someone's life be changed let their hearts be pricked the lives be changed just move for someone that they see they need to be faithful to you if it's one of our unsaved loved ones God they see this thing and realize they need to rekindle that passion that time may be running out itself because we don't know when that day is God to get them to turn around they see that they need you, that they need that Acts 238 salvation. I'm going to ask you, Lord, to bless uh, your church. God, keep us united. Bless the pastor. Give him wisdom and knowledge in this time. God, take this virus away. Speak that word of healing to get rid of it. Touch all those that are suffering with it, all those that are fighting with it. God, we ask you, Lord, to, again, bless your church people and do whatever it takes to get us back in the church together again. We give you all the praise and the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I love you. I hope to see you soon. Hope everyone has a good week.